Hi, and welcome to the lecture on behavior estimation for self-driving cars. This lecture is part of the course Techniques for Self-Driving Cars here at the Photogrammetry and Robotics Lab at the University of Bonn. Before we start, I would like to motivate uh, the topic and show you an example of how behavior estimation works in practice. So this, is, uh, this example is from the recent Tesla AI day, and you will see on the right the autonomous vehicle in red with its planned path, and you will see the perceived environment. So the car is equipped with sensors, in this case cameras, you see the front camera on the left side, and this is what the car thinks about its environment. So you will see other detected cars, and you can already uh, guess that this is a very packed street with a lot of parked cars, and it's not easy to navigate through this um, street, especially if there are other cars involved. In this example, you will see that there is an oncoming car which is detected here in yellow. And because of that, the red car first plans to yield to this car because of the higher velocity of the yellow car. But then it realizes that the yellow car is basically also yielding and slowing down. And then our ego path changes and we plan to overtake or go through these parked cars. If we continue the situation, another car is coming up in yellow, which is even faster. And now we run our behavior estimation again and try to estimate what the yellow car is going to do. And here are two possibilities. One is that the yellow car is going to yield and our prediction method assigns it a low probability. And the other uh, possibility is that the oncoming car is going straight and passing the parked cars and we assign a higher probability. So because of that, the own ego plan will be to yield or to pull over in order to not block the road here or not to crash into the yellow car. But if we run the behavior estimation again, we will realize that the car yields instead and it will slow down such that our prediction of the future, the yellow car enables us to now past it um, because we re realized that the yellow car is going to yield and we can go because there's a freeway in front of us. So where, to we, where can we integrate behavior planning into our planning pipeline? And if we think about planning in general, we can uh, divide it in different uh, modules. So it's an hierarchical approach I show here. Basically the global planning, behavior planning and the local planning. And these different modules have a um, specific and different uh, abstraction level and a level of frequency. So this is the frequency with, the, with which you um, update the, the plan. And here you will see that at the bottom there's a lower abstraction level and a higher frequency. So for the global planning we put in our start and goal configuration and the global planner returns a very coarse and a rough path we can take. So it, for example, takes a map of the street um, or of the cities and then plans where we roughly want to go. So this is why we can we have a high abstraction level, so we're not considering traffic signs or other traffic participants. And we can also run it in a low frequency because we only need to update it if there is a traffic jam or a blocked road. In the middle, we have the behavior planning um, that handles different situations, um, for example, at an intersection or if you are on a highway, the behavior planner, planner can decide or will decide whether you stay behind a vehicle and stay on your road or if you want to um, overtake another vehicle by a lane change. So all these different maneuvers are handled in the behavior planner that runs at a mid um, frequency and has a mid abstraction level. And then below we have the local planning that based on the uh, maneuver outputs the actual trajectory the car wants to follow. So here we have a low abstraction level because we need to take a lot of information into account and we run it at a high frequency because uh, for example other vehicles that cross our path um, we um, lead, lead us to replan the local plan um, in order to avoid collisions for example. So if we observe new uh, things in our environment we need to adapt our local plan more frequently. And behavior estimation can now be considered as a part of the behavior planning, so it can support the decision making here. Because in order to 
um, decide which maneuver to take, we need to know what other traffic participants are going to do in the future. So in general, the behavior planning plans a maneuver to follow the global plan. And these man tr uh, transitions between the maneuvers, uh, of course, depend on traffic participants. So we have seen this, we have, uh, seen this in the video before, where our own um, future motion or the maneuver, so yielding or going straight, uh, depend, was depending on what the yellow car will do. So we changed our decision to yield to the decision to just go straight, just because we saw that the other car was yielding for us. And this shows us that behavior estimation can actually support the decision making. And here's another example with an intersection. So here we also need to perceive the environment, uh, check the different traffic lights, but we also need to check where the other cars are, because it can always be the case that the car, other cars are violating the traffic rules. So even if we have a green light and the others need to wait, it can be that one of the cars is just running the red light. In this case, it's also important to uh, check this and to estimate what, what is the intention of the other cars. Are they actually breaking the rule now or are they still following the rule and yielding? So, what information can we use in order to uh, estimate the behavior of others? So one common thing to use are past states of other traffic participants, uh, which can be position, velocity, acceleration, or uh, the orientation. And these usually uh, come from a perception system with a detection and tracking um, module, module on board. Or we can also use it by communicating our states among the traffic participants, if this is technically possible. Another input we can use is map information. So if we have an HD map of our environment, we know where the different lanes are, we know about traffic lights, and we can um, yeah, use this for an informed decision. For example, if a car is on the uh, lane dedicated for a lane change, we know that the car is most likely going to do a lane change. Finally, we can also use uh, sensor data in general, so from camera, LiDAR, or radar sensors, um, as you can see here. Um, because we could, for example, infer from a camera image if the car in front of us is um, going to turn just because of the turn signal, or if we see braking lights, we know that the car is probably decelerating. To be more precise about the problem, uh, we can model the uh, driving scenario with N agents as a partially observable stochastic game. So this game is partially observable because we do not observe the full environment, because there is noise involved in the process from our uh, sensors. We might have occlusion, so we are probably not able to see all traffic participants around us. And it's stochastic because the uh, state transition is probabilistic. In this graph, you can see that there are um, nodes which denote the variables, and there are the directed edges that show the dependencies among these variables. And the N agents in this model are now stacked behind each other, so in the depth dimension, and the horizontal axis denotes the time. So first we have a physical state X of an agent I at time T, and this could be the position, the heading, the velocity, or the acceleration. And this state is usually not directly observable. What we get from the environment uh, are these observations. Um, so each agent I gets an observation at time t of its own state, but also all the other states. And this dependency just shows us that we can observe parts of these uh, physical states, but not all of them. So that depends on the uh, observation model we have. After that, each agent I updates its internal state bi based on the internal state b t minus i, so in this case, it's the one under the previous time step, and the received uh, measurement. Um, so the internal state uh, represents, um, for example, the goal state the agent wants to reach, or the desired velocity, or the driving style. And in this model, this depends on, uh, the, as I said, the previous uh, internal state, and also the new incoming measurements. So if we observe, um, a different uh, physical state of others, we might update this internal state. 
And finally, uh, we have a control action UI, which is then selected based on a policy. And this policy depends on the updated internal state. So it's this dependency here. And with the control uh, we derived, um, you can apply it. And then this, this leads to a new physical state. So we have a transition function that models the, um, how the state evolves from time t to t plus 1, given the previous state and the um, control input we applied. So what are possible um, estimation tasks we can perform on this graph? One is the state estimation. So here we want to infer the states of all agents at a specific time step. And if we do this for all states in the past, we will have the full past trajectory of states. And this could, for example, be a localization of our own ego state, or if you estimate the states of others, this would be a detection and tracking, for example. Another task is the intention and trade information. So if you're interested in the internal states of an agent at time t, uh, we can do this. So we will um, have a definition of the intention and trade estimation later. But in general, this uh, is modeled by the internal state. And this internal state can, for example, be used to integrate the navigational goals of others into the ego behavior planning. So one task might be to reason about what, where do the other traffic participants want to go. And then finally, another task or the last task is the motion prediction. So the motion prediction aims at estimating the physical states of the agents for the future time steps. So for the time steps from T plus 1 to a um, specific horizon, so up to Tf, we want to infer or estimate the future uh, physical sta uh, states. And you can see that this uh, depends, of course, on the st uh, state we are starting, so the initial state, but also the uh, control policy or also the internal states. In this lecture, we will focus on intention and trade estimation as well as the motion prediction. So let's start with the intention estimation. So here you will see a situation with a, a self-driving vehicle in purple. And we want to do a left turn. And here's another vehicle in white that might turn right or, um, go, uh, or might go straight. And our goal is now to just infer this high-level behavior. So to answer the question, is the white car going to uh, turn left or is it going to continue driving straight? And if we know this behavior or if we have inferred this behavior, uh, we can adapt our own planning based on this estimation. So if, the, if we estimate that the car is doing, going to do a right turn with a high probability, we can already make our left turn. If we say that it's going straight, we need to wait and um, yeah, yield until the white car passed us. And in general, there are different levels of interaction you can imagine about intention estimation. So here, the white vehicle will most likely not change its goal based on our planning. Um, but there are other situations. If you, for example, consider a highway merging scenario, um, there might be, so if you want to merge on the highway, um, there might be a cooperative driver on the left. And if you signalize that you want to merge in front of him, he, for example, could decelerate and let you merge if it's very packed and it's otherwise hard to merge. Um, but if it's, for example, an aggressive driver, um, he might continue and even accelerate such that you then should merge behind him. So here, uh, behavior estimation uh, depends also on the, on the interactions between the different participants. So in general, in intention estimation, we want to infer what other drivers want to do in the future. And as shown in the example, this can often be modeled with the probability distribution over high-level behavior modes. So we have different actions like lane changing, turning or overtaking, and we can assign a probability for each of these actions, um, or you can estimate the probability and then um, yeah, adapt our planning based on this estimation by, for example, conditioning our motion prediction on the estimated intention and then use the future trajectory of the traffic participants to plan our path. There are different intention estimation paradigms and in general we can 
um, differentiate between recursive estimation or single shot estimation. So for a recursive estimation, we have our um, probability distribution over the internal state of the agents at a specific time step. And we can model this as a function of the um, distribution of our, our belief at the previous time step and our new observations. So these are the observations we as the ego vehicle got at uh, time step t. And then we always update uh, our belief recursively. In single shot estimation, um, we model the probability distribution of the internal state as a function of a specific, a specific window of observations from the past. And some techniques you can apply here are in general Bayesian models, where we explicitly define conditional probability distributions and then infer the posterior probability given uh, the observed variables. Another method uh, is, the, um, is deep learning. So here we define a mapping from input to outputs and optimize this model or this mapping based on data we observe from a data set. And finally, uh, there are also game theory methods. And these model the intention estimation as a game of players. And each player tries to optimize uh, its own cost function. And with game theory, you can explicitly reason about the interactions and especially about how our own actions will influence the decisions of others. Okay, let's continue with trade estimation. So the difference between intention and trade estimation is that with trade estimation, we now want to define how the goal is reached or accomplished. So it's more about dif different trades, and these uh, tra trades de um, depend on the skill of the driver or the preferences, like social preferences. Is he more aggressive, more cooperative? Um, and this can be inferred uh, with the trade estimation. And in this example, I already mentioned it, uh, we have a um, highway merging scenario. And if you consider this blue car on the left, that is on the lane, and we are the orange car here, we want to merge. We can, for example, estimate, is the driver uh, cooperating with us? So in this case, he might even decelerate and let us pass in front, as shown here. Or if he's more um, aggressive, we can also estimate that he will probably not let us pass and he might even accelerate and we should then merge behind him. So example traits are um, parameters, policy parameters of a driver model. So we have a fixed model and we need to infer different parameters um, to use this model. And these can, for example, be the minimum desired gap a driver uh, wants to maintain. So in a driving scenario on a highway, for example, uh, each driver has a different minimum desired gap he wants to keep. So a truck driver usually uh, wants a larger gap because he needs more time to uh, brake. Um, another one is the maximum feasible acceleration. So not all cars can uh, accelerate in the same manner. So these are parameters um, we can infer from observing uh, driving behavior and then uh, feed this or use these parameters in our model to yeah, model the, uh, for example, the future behavior with, with the driver model. We can also infer parameters of a cost function. So if we assume that each player has a specific cost function and he drives in a way that optimizes this, this cost function, we can infer the different parameters or weights. So how is a driver weighting the um, progress on the street versus the control efforts or the acceleration he needs to do for it. And in general, we can discriminate between offline and online methods. So in an offline method, we estimate all these parameters in advance based on observations. Um, and in contrast to online methods, where we can update these parameters. So if we observe a new driver um, and his behavior doesn't fit to our model, we can update these parameters um, to yeah, get a better estimate of its behavior. Some paradigms we can use here are again Bayesian models, where we, for example, have a prior distribution of trade parameters, and then we condition this distribution online on new observations we get. For example, uh, if a new driver comes up or a new type of driver. You can also use optimization methods, for example, inverse reinforcement learning, where we try to infer a reward function from an expert driver demonstration. 
Or finally, it's also very common to use heuristics. So uh, um, in this case, an expert uh, defines and tweaks some parameters that are very inter interpretable um, and uses his expert knowledge to yeah, model how the drivers behave on the street. But of course, this is usually less realistic and also happens on, uh, offline. So the expert uh, needs to tune it in advance and then you deploy it and the parameters are fixed. So now we have a look at our third topic, which is motion prediction. In motion prediction, so if we go back to our example, we do not want to know the high level behavior. So we're not interested in just turning right or driving straight, but we want to know the exact trajectory. So for example, the X and Y positions of the white car over time. And this can be used to um, yeah, plan our own path. And for example, to check if there is a collision, um, if we want to turn left here. And if we do the intention estimation before, this can of course inform this motion prediction. So if we already know that with a very high probability, the white car is going straight, it's easier for us to estimate the trajectory, which is underlying. So in motion prediction, we want to predict the future states for a specific time horizon of n traffic participants. And if we go back to our graphical model, we can see that this can be modeled by a state transition function. So the future state depends on the past state and the applied control of each agent. And the state transition model um, can, for example, be physics or geometry based or also learn from data. So if you have this model and you know the states and the control, you can also model the future states of a car. But of course, in most situations, you also want the interactions among traffic participants. So what are different uh, hypotheses we can output as motion? So what are different outputs we might be interested in? So the one I already mentioned um, is just a single trajectory. So for example, x, y over time. Uh, we can also output multimodal trajectories. So if there are different um, possibilities for the future, we can output more trajectories that reflect these, for example, two modes in the previous example. So we would then output some trajectories that go straight and some that turn right. And then the planner needs to um, yeah, account for these different possibilities. Another way is to output uh, bounding boxes, so 3D or 2D bounding boxes, which can also be used in the planning to reason about the um, dimensions of the traffic participant, um, yeah, which is either needed for avoiding collisions. Um, it's also possible to output Gaussian uh, distributions. So here we already we also have a notion of uncertainty. So we know about how certain our model is um, about this future position of another uh, agent. Uh, it's also very common to use uh, occupancy grid map maps. Um, here we we do not have the notion of what is a car, for example, what is a truck, or what is in general an agent, and what is, for example, just a static obstacle like a wall. But we just model everything in a grid map, and we um, reason about the occupancy of the different cells in this grid map. And with this, we can easily use it in planning and plan a path that is collision-free. So we do not want to traverse areas with a high um, occupancy probability. So this is also a possible output for motion prediction. Then there are forward and backward reachable sets. Um, so with a forward reachable set, we um, derive the future states. We can reach from, from an initial state under specific constraints. So here we, we can only predict feasible trajectories for the future. And with backward reachable sets, uh, we get the initial states from which a goal can be reached under specific constraints. And this can be used uh, to check if a state is, for example, unsafe because of a collision, um, or, if, or, or if we can reach a specific state without collisions, um, or we can also model adversarial human behavior by assuming that another car wants to hit us with the maximum velocity or acceleration it can achieve, and the backward reachable set can be used here to uh, plan a safe path with respect to these uh, adversarial setup. Um, finally, it's also um, possible to output the raw sensor data. So to, for example, predict what the camera will see next or what the LiDAR will receive next. 
Um, the advantage here is that um, we can do this without the need of the true uh, trajectories, for example, in order to evaluate the performance, because we can always get the next sensor reading and we can check how good our prediction actually was. Um, but of course, this is harder to use in planning because then we still need to infer um, or we still need to reason about what uh, are we going to do with this information about the future sensor reading. So let's look at some uh, paradigms we can use for motion prediction. So one is the closed loop uh, forward simulation. So here we roll out a closed loop control policy for each agent at each time step. So if you look at this pseudocode, um, which is based on the graphical model we have seen, uh, for, so for each time step and for each agent, we will run these steps. So we will first receive the observation based on the um, internal, uh, sorry, based on the physical state of the N agents at the time step. And with this new observation, we can update our internal state based on this um, mapping H. So we use the previous internal state and update this one with the new observation. And we will then feed this internal state to our control policy that gives us the control for a specific agent at a specific time step. And then we can use the already mentioned motion model to um, yeah, derive the, the next state based on the previous physical state and the input we apply, or the control we apply. So depending on this observation function, so uh, we have a very, or we have an interaction aware approach. So if we perceive a lot of the environment, we can actually include this um, and we can reason about what other traffic participants are going to do in order to um, yeah, define our internal state here. So if our observation captures a lot of the real physical states, we can account for this in the prediction. But if, for example, a lot of occlusions um, happen, then it's probably not easy to, to include this knowledge about future interaction. So that depends, in this case, on the observation function. Um, a drawback of the method is that we require a control policy. So we need to define, in general, all these um, mappings, all these functions or models, um, and especially the control policy. So we need to define what is the control action each agent is going to take in a specific time. Um, and this, of course, depends on his own preferences or constraints or goals. So we need to reason about um, this when we want to find a good policy for each agent. Um, other paradigms or methods to infer the future motion is the independent prediction. So here we do not consider the other agents in the scene, but we predict a future motion for each agent individually. So this is very fast and parallelizable because we can run it for all agents in parallel. But of course, we do not model any interactions among them. So it could be uh, the output that we um, then predict trajectories for the agents that actually inter, um, uh, cross each other and will lead to, um, to a collision, for example, and because we do, did not consider any of the other agents. And this outcome is usually less likely because yeah, traffic agents try to avoid each other and do not want to collide. Um, so this is one, one drawback of this method. Finally, we also have game theoretic approaches so I already mentioned this, this method. Um, here we model um, the situation or the driving scenario as a game where each agent is a player playing the game. And with this, we can explicitly reason about how the others react to the um, future trajectory. So there's the interaction between um, the different, different traffic participants also for the future time step. But it's usually not easy um, to solve this problem, especially with an increasing um, number of agents because then we also have more interactions among these agents. Now we will focus on some motion prediction models in more detail. We will start with the constant velocity model, which is an independent prediction method. So you see that there is only one car involved for our prediction. So this is the ego car we want to predict the, uh, for which we want to predict the future motion. We know the past states of the car and independently now means that we do not consider any other cars in the environment. So we just take the uh, past velocity of the car and we assume that it will keep this velocity and will also keep the orient current orientation. 
And this leads to a straight line prediction um, for the future states. You, could, you can do this with a single trajectory, but you can also um, sample, for example, angular offsets and then output multiple trajectories. In general, this is uh, very easy to uh, so this baseline is very easy to implement and also achieves a good result usually. If you consider a highway scenario, if the cars don't merge the lane lanes or change the lanes, they will mostly uh, just drive in a straight line with a linear velocity and only sometimes decelerate or accelerate depending on the traffic situation. But yeah, for most of the time, it's already a very good baseline. But if you consider um, nonlinear motion, um, like here, when the uh, road is, uh, has a curvature, or if, as I said, the car decelerates or accelerates, the constant velocity model cannot capture this. You can then maybe use a constant acceleration or yaw rate model, um, but all these methods uh, share that they are independent, so they do not consider any interaction of the cars. So this can lead to um, yeah, worse predictions in case there are uh, cars involved in your environment. So one way to uh, tackle this that was introduced in the literature is the social forces model. Here we consider different agents, in this example agents A and B, and we assume that these act in a force field. And we then know from physics that if you have um, a force which is, apply on, uh, which is applied on a point mass with a mass m, then you can derive the acceleration of this uh, point mass and from the acceleration with some initial conditions you can uh, retrieve the trajectory by solving this differential equation. Here you see an example with the agents A and B and we want to predict the future motion of agent A. And the question now is what are these forces and how do we determine these forces? So we can model the impact of or the influence of agent B to agent A as a force that is acting in this direction, so it's acting against agent A, because we observe from human uh, behavior, from human motion, that pedestrians, for example, don't want to crash into each other, so they tend to avoid each other. And at the same time, we have a goal we want to reach, so we can model this um, drive to the goal uh, with another force that acts in the direction of the goal. And we can do this also with obstacles, for example, with static obstacles, and yeah, model these or their impact or their influence on our motion as a force acting against us. So in this example, the solution could be something like this, that we will finally reach the goal, but we will take a small right turn in order to uh, keep more distance to agent B. Here you see a simulation of the social forces model. So there are um, point masses or pedestrians from all these four um, sites and they um, yeah, first go to the middle here and here they will get assigned a goal so they then yeah, um, ch change the direction and at the same time so the goal or the, the, yeah, the goal is acting like a force towards the goal and at the same time the other participants around each uh, pedestrian are acting against it and you can see that they avoid collisions but sometimes as here you also see some uh, states where uh, the pedestrian is blocked so it's a good, an easy to implement uh, situation, uh, simulation. But yeah, it's, it does not explain all the um, behaviors you can, op you, can, you can see or you can see in real life. So the main challenge is to define and parameterize these forces that explain the behavior. So it's probably less intuitive to model this uh, with a force. And yeah, each force needs to be modeled and you need to find parameters and maybe even adapt these parameters to different agents. And as you saw before, it leads to uh, less realistic predictions. So this was an easy example with just four corners, but if you consider uh, a street or um, a hall, for example, and people move in all directions, um, yeah, it's sometimes not very realistic uh, with this approach. So sometimes also people walk together in one direction without uh, diverging. And another problem is that it does not apply for cars that follow a road structure, at least not the, um, let's say, vanilla social force model. So when, on a highway driving, we have specific rules and we have um, a, a lane structure, and it's not easy to implement this into such a social force model, which was 
more developed for um, pedestrian uh, moving prediction, uh, motion prediction. So the question is, can we model human driving behavior with a different model? Um, one solution is the intelligent driver model. So as you see here um, on, the, on this bird's eye view picture of a highway scene, um, the intelligent driver model is intended for scenarios where cars are following each other. And you can already guess from the image that the future motion of cars that follow each other mainly depends on some parameters like the distance between them or the velocity um, they want to go for. And this is the yeah, main concept of the uh, intelligent driver model. So it's a car following model with some parameters. So we'll talk about these parameters in the next slide. The uh, output of the model is the acceleration of an ego vehicle. So here we have this car following situation with our ego vehicle on the left. And this yeah, model gives us the acceleration as a function of the uh, current speed of the model, the speed of the model in front of it, uh, the speed of the car in front of it, sorry, um, and also the distance between the two cars, and also the uh, parameters. So let's have a look at these parameters and how is the acceleration actually computed. So this is the um, yeah uh, this is the function for the intelligent driver model. Um, you see basically two parts here. Um, so this s star, which is um, denoted here is the um, desired distance you want to keep, but it's a dynamic distance. So it depends also on some uh, velocity, um, on, on, on some velocities. And we will now go through the different parts in more detail. So first let's talk about the parameters. We need to uh, first get and then put them in the model. So we have the maximum vehicle acceleration A. So that's what the car is able to accelerate at maximum or what the driver wants to uh, do at maximum. We have the desired velocity of the driver here and in, on the nominator you see the actual velocity of the driver. There is the, so in this um, dynamic desired or the desired dynamic distance you see the minimum spacing in congested traffic. So when the car stands still this is the minimum spacing a driver wants to keep. There's the desired time headway, so the time until you collide with the car in front. And there's a comfortable braking deceleration B. Um, yeah, this is also something which depends on each driver. So it's also, you also need to infer this before or estimate it or somehow tune it. And finding an exponent for, for this uh, relation here. And in this model we can identify two different parts. So one is the free road behavior. So if you consider this right part and you have a, um, a free road, so there's no car in front, then the distance to the next car is going to infinity or is at least very large if, if we cannot see another car in front. Um, and this means that this term is going to zero and the acceleration is only determined by this left part. So this is the free road behavior. And if the actual velocity is close to the um, desired velocity, we will, this will, will become one and we will not accelerate further. And if the uh, actual velocity is, for example, lower, we will have an acceleration to reach our uh, desired velocity. The right part is um, called an interaction term. So it, uh, if you look, look at the, this uh, formula, you can see that if there's a small um, net distance, which means that uh, this distance here is small, the impact of the interaction term will increase. So if there is a closed car in front of you, um, this impact, uh, this, this uh, term will get larger and will influence our acceleration. So if you look here, if we have a large speed difference um, between, this is the delta V alpha here, so if the speed difference of your, the car in front and, and uh, yourself or the ego car is large, we will then uh, brake more in order to increase the distance again. So this is the sort of safety mechanism most drivers do. And if the delta is very small, you can uh, see this interaction term more like a small repulsive force because only this part remains. And this force is um, yeah, basically resulting in an equilibrium net distance 
So for specific velocities of the two drivers, um, we will then just keep a specific, specific distance to our uh, car in front. And yeah, you can derive this from, from the function here. Some advantages of the intelligent driver model are that it's also simple but effective. So there are just some parameters involved um, and it can model a lot of different situations. But the parameters uh, and, and the parameters are very intuitive. So you've seen that we can probably already define some of them um, just by hand from our experience. But at the same time, um, in some scenarios, the driver model is less realistic. So we cannot cover probably all um, situations like an intersection or roundabout or an emergency stopping. So some of them are covered with the model, but since it's a car following model, we cannot use it for all scenarios we can imagine. And it does not work well for pedestrians because pedestrians um, yeah, have different priorities while driving and yeah, they're not paying attention to, uh, for example, the uh, distance and also the velocity when it comes to the pedestrian in front of you. So there's just a different behavior for pedestrians. So the question arises, how can we model more realistic motion? So we have now seen some other models, but uh, usually all these um, independent predictions or model-based predictions with some parameters uh, yield to uh, good predictions, but sometimes less realistic. So it's not it's hard to really look them, make them look like real predictions or like yeah, uh, trajectories we can observe in real data. And one way to approach this problem is by um, deep learning based method methods. So here the goal is that we learn to predict a future trajectory from large real, real world data sets. So we have a lot of examples how drivers um, yeah, um, drive in the real world and we can yeah, learn to predict these uh, future motion. So the advantage of these models um, are that we have an implicit trait modeling. So we, at least in the ba um, basic Mandela models, we do not need to uh, implicitly model the traits like high level behaviors or define transition functions, for example. Um, this is all included in, in the model. And the models, or these models are usually able to have a high representational capacity. So we can capture, for example, different uh, traffic agents like cars or pedestrians or trucks and we do not need too many hand-based rules and decide for each um, agent which model are we going to apply. There are also some disadvantages of the deep learning methods. So the parameters are no longer inter interpretable. So we cannot pick a parameter and say this specific weight um, is responsible for, for this or we can tune it by ourselves. So in contrast to the intelligent driver model where the parameters are very uh, intuitive here we have way more parameters and optimize them without actually saying what each parameter is going to do. We are also usually not explicitly modeling interactions. So in contrast to game theory methods, um, this is not considered in a lot of deep learning based methods. And it's also less robust for unseen scenarios. So if you deploy your model, which has been trained on some um, data, on some training data, you deploy it in into an unknown environment. Uh, and for example, you encounter a situation that was not in the training distribution, then you do not have any guarantees what the model will output. So this is a challenge with the deep learning based methods. Here's a short reminder of how the main components in deep learning work with each other. So we have our model here and we use um, past data as the input and output a future trajectory and with the ground truth trajectory we get from um, the observed data we can compute a loss signal for example with the root mean squared error and this loss can be used to optimize the model weights by for example back propagation so then we compute the influence of each weight here on the loss and by back propagating we can then update the weights in order to improve the loss at the next step Some paradigms that are used um, for motion prediction with deep learning are listed here. So basically what we do is we do sequence to sequence prediction because we have a sequence, a temporal sequence of input data and we want to output a temporal sequence of um, data. And some methods 
for example, are the recurrent neural networks or convolutional neural networks, or a combination of them. It's also common to use a graph neural network. So here you model each agent as a graph node and the dependencies or the interactions as edges. And it's also um, one, another way to, to model uh, motion prediction with deep learning is with transformers. So these came up very recently. Um, they are also used in language processing to, to capture um, as sequences, uh, temporal sequences of data. And the main advantage is that it's possible to um, attend, so they have an attention mechanism, and they can attend from a position in the output sequence to any position in the input sequence. So then do not need to uh, process the sequence uh, step by step, but they have a, let's say, a full, full view on the input sequence. So this solves some, some problems that arise in the other models. Finally, another way is um, to, uh, with a generative adversarial networks. Here you have a generator that generates trajectories and a discriminator that gets either the um, ground truth trajectory, which is realistic and real, or your predicted trajectory and it needs to decide um, if it's real or not. And by having this adversarial network setting that basically the generator tries to fool the discriminator, um, the generator will learn to output uh, very realistic trajectories. So you can explicitly reason about uh, yeah, getting trajectories that look real and uh, are very close to actual human behavior. And for these methods we can in general discriminate between deterministic or stochastic models. So for a deterministic model, if you um, use the same input for your model, again, you will also get the same output. So there's no stochastic involved. And for stochastic models, we, for example, uh, can sample different trajectories for the same input and generate multiple proposals. So we can capture multimodal behavior with this, for example. So in this lecture, we will focus on the first two models, so the recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural networks, and we'll now start with the recurrent neural networks. So here you see the basic setup of a recurrent neural network. So we have our network A in the middle, which will be defined later, and there is an input uh, x at time t and an output h at time t, and we the, the network operates on the input xd, but also some part from the previous iteration. So we always we have some output and we feed also um, some part of the output back to the input. And if you unroll this in time, like here, so this is the temporal axis now, you see the structure that we use the same model A, but we always pass something to the next iteration. And with this we can... Um, yeah, make a prediction here, for example, based on the full input sequence because we always pass some information to the next time step. So what actually happens in A? So in the uh, basic recurrent neural network, we have um, this function here. So the in this case, the output um, H is also the hidden state that gets passed to the next state. Um, you can also use a another layer on top, like an output layer to define how your output should look like. But in this case, um, we consider the uh, an easy example where we just use this hidden state H as output and also pass it then to the next um, iteration. So here you see that we, at each time step, so if in order to compute this HT, we take the hidden state from the previous time step and our new input XT, we concatenate these um, multiply it with a weight matrix, add a bias, and finally um, apply an activation function um, to add some non-linearity. And these weights and biases are learnable, so these are optimized um, to yeah, fit uh, the data. So as you have seen before, the optimization step uh, can change these values in order to produce uh, better outputs. So the advantages of um, recurrent neural networks or RNNs are that we have um, a weight sharing. So at each time step, we use the same um, network A, so the same W and uh, so weight matrix W and bias B. So in contrast to a fully connected net where we input a sequence, uh, here we can um, use the same network for each time step, whereas for the fully connected net, um, 
you're, it's very likely that you, for example, overfit to some specific positions in the sequence because each, each, each uh, weight is uh, dedicated to a specific position in the sequence. And another advantage is that we can process variable sequence length. So we can input uh, um, this is the, the length of the sequence here. Um, it's not fixed, so compared to a fully connected net where you only have a specific input size and an output size, here we can do this process as long as we want or as long as we have input data and then consider the last uh, output as our prediction. Some uh, disadvantages of the method are that um, the prediction is usu usually slow. So as you can see here, each stage has to wait for the previous stage to yeah, output the um, hidden state or this internal state that gets passed to the next iteration. Um, so yeah, compared to other methods, it's, it's slow, especially for long sequences. And you can encounter the problem of vanishing or exploding radiance. So the information flow in this network, especially for long sequences, um, can be very long since it goes through the whole network. So if there is an input here, x0, that has a large influence to um, this output at time t, and you want to you, you compute the loss for this output and backpropagate, um, yeah, it's a very long way through the network, and these gradients can then be uh, accumulated and basically explode, or they can also vanish and um, yeah, go to zero, such that the this input basically does not lead, lead, need, uh, lead to any update of the weights in A because the gradient already uh, vanished across the way. So if you consider um, this recurrent neural network for language processing, you can think of a, a sentence and you want to predict the next word at some point in the sentence. Um, so you first process all the words in the sentence and if the output depends on the first word in the sentence, then this can be a problem because you would need to um, yeah, backpropagate through all the words here in all the, in this case it's not time, but it's the position in the sequence uh, in order to get the influence from the first word. So it's in general hard to maintain information from the beginning of the sequence here. So one way to resolve this problem was introduced with the long short term memory. So this is the setup with the recurrent neural network in our network A, and we now replace this network with this more sophistic sophisticated structure. And we will now have a closer look at this block. So you already see that we have now four neural network layers with different activation functions. And there are also um, some pointwise operations of these vectors, some uh, transfers, concatenation, and, oper and copy operations. Um, but we will now go uh, through each of these mechanisms in more detail. The first thing you will realize is that there is a new um, vector which um, we use in this uh, setup. So this is the cell state. So at each time step we have a cell state C um, and we use the previous cell state C T minus 1 in this model. And this, as you can see, is a direct connection. So from T minus 1 to T with just some minor operations here. So this makes it possible to maintain a cell state and solve the, solve the problem of uh, vanishing or exploding radiance. Because now it's, it's easier for the network to learn to maintain a specific state throughout the sequence processing. So the first part we want to discuss is the forget gate. So you see that there is the input xt and the previous hidden state ht minus 1 and we apply similar to the previous uh, function um, this projection with the matrix wf and the bias bf which are also learnable and an activation function to compute the f and we will use an activation function, so a sigma activation function, such that the um, values of f are between 0 and 1. And the goal is that this uh, vector now determines which parts of the cell state do we want to carry on to the next iteration and which one do we want to forget. So if you predict a 0 for a specific entry, this means that you do not want to keep the cell state at this specific um, position. You basically want to forget it. And if you predict a 1, you want to keep it because you will need it for the next iteration. Another gate is the um, input gate. 
So here we again use our um, state xt and the um, hidden state ht minus one. We compute two things now. One is the input gate with a similar structure than the forget gate. So we again output a value between zero and one for each position in the vector, which defines uh, which parts of the input of the computed input or cell update do we want to keep and apply and which do we want to throw away or discard. And the cell update is um, yeah, computed with this uh, function. So we again concatenate these two. We have the projection um, with the bias and apply a ton h. So here we uh, scale these to uh, minus one and one. So this will be our new cell state or the cell state update. And we then combine them on this uh, line here. So we use the forget gate to determine which parts of the cell state do we want to keep and which do we want to forget. And with the input vector or the input gate vector, we determine which parts of the new cell state do we keep and which do we forget. And then the cell state for the next step is the sum of these two. Finally, we have the output gate. So this gate determines what is our actual output for this stage. So we compute the um, output vector here, similarly as the input and forget gate with an output between zero and one. And the actual output is now uh, based on the new computed cell state um, with a ton h activation function. And with the uh, OT vector, we define which parts do we output as ht and which parts do we uh, want to throw away basically. So with this LSTM model, you see that there are some more mechanisms involved and it enables us to um, maintain a cell state that can, for example, summarize, um, if you consider motion prediction, the cell state could summarize um, yeah, some traits or information you need for predict the future uh, motion. And you can update the cell state based on the new inputs or the new observations you get. So this is a new introduced mechanism here. And the question now is how can we use the LSTMs for predicting a full sequence. So here we have only considered the prediction of one single output. Um, and the question is how can we encode a full sequence and predict a full sequence. So if you want to do sequence prediction, we can consider this in an, um, with an LSTM encoder and decoder architecture. So we have one LSTM here, um, which encodes the sequence. So as we have seen before, it processes all the inputs we have and finally outputs a hidden state and a cell state at the time step t. So we want to make the prediction for t plus one and t plus two until t plus uh, tf or tf. And as soon as we get these hidden state and cell state that summarize these input sequence, we can use another LSTM, a decoder LSTM that predicts these outputs in an autoregressive fashion. So this means that we always take as input, in this first case, the last internal, uh, the last physical state we got. Uh, we take these hidden and cell state representations and output the first uh, future state at t plus one. And then um, at inference or at test time, we use this, feed it back to the next um, uh, iteration step and use this prediction as input and make the prediction for the next time step based on the previous prediction and the new hidden and cell state, which were updated. During training, we can uh, use a concept which is called teacher forcing. That means that we do not feed back our actual prediction because at training, the prediction uh, in the beginning might not make uh, too much sense because we st still need to optimize the weights in the network. So here it's common to use teacher forcing and to use the um, real ground truth future values here because at training time we have access to these values and uh, this can lead to a, a you know, faster training and speed up learning in the end. Now if you consider this LSTM encoder decoder structure, one problem we might still face is that we do not consider the influence of other neighbors. So in the previous slide you saw that we just process the uh, input sequence for each state, uh, for each agent individually. And now the question is, can we somehow add information about um, other pe uh, 
other traffic participants in our environment. So on this picture you see the um, different agents here in the scene. Each is modeled with an LSTM encoder-decoder architecture. You see the predictions here and now the question is how do we connect these predictions um, on, this, on the spatial level. So because we know these pedestrians are close to each other, they might to avoid um, each other and this one is more far away. So the influence of this prediction is probably less. Um, so the influence of the others on this prediction is, is less compared on the, to, to the crowded scene here. So there is an, um, a model which is called social LSTM that actually yeah, um, works on this problem. So here the assumption is that the hidden state of the LSTM contains um, some features about the motion of an agent. So as I said before, the hidden state could, for example, encode um, something like the, the goal the agent is going for or the overall um, style if, if he's more aggressive and accelerating or more um, uh, slow in general or maybe more cooperative. So these features can be encoded in the hidden state and the authors of um, the social LSTM um, proposed the idea to share these hidden states among the LSTMs. So here you see two different time steps, so T1 and T2 with the different LSTMs for each agent. And in this time step here, we um, take the hidden states, so for the black agent, in this example, for the black agent, we take the hidden states of the neighbors in blue and in yellow, and we pool these hidden states and then feed this as an additional input to the LSTM. So we share these hidden states or the encoded information about the motion with the um, neighboring agents. And this is done by um, here considering the local neighborhood around the black agent and then for the closest neighbors you take the these hidden states, the hidden vectors um, at this specific time step, and pull them into a new tensor H3 and provide this uh, to the next LSTM layer. So each LSTM um, in the decoder stage then predicts uh, the, the next cell and hidden state based on the previous cell and hidden state, um, the new input, but also the hidden state of the neighboring agents. And with this uh, shared hidden state information, the authors could show that um, yeah, for some situations uh, you see a difference in the prediction, so the method accounts for other agents in the scene. And here's a comparison, uh, a qualitative comparison of the different methods. So in yellow we have the ground truth future trajectory, in blue is the social force model we discussed, orange is the linear model, so the constant velocity model, and in red dashed we have the social LSTM. And in these cases you see that the prediction here, for example, um, is more accurate because it considers the uh, other traffic participant here or here. It predicts a left turn because there is an, uh, I think there is some, something in the way, for example. So the spatial relation um, of other agents in this scene is included in the model. But of course there are also some failures uh, if the agent is decelerating or acceleration, uh, accelerating um, or yeah, some other um, modes that are not captured. So you see some um, improvements for, for interactive scenarios, but there are still a lot of challenges involved, um, as you can see in this lower part here. So besides the recurrent neural networks we discussed, we can also use convolutional neural networks. So you might know them from image processing where we uh, use a filter to convolve along the spatial dimensions of the, the image, so the height and width dimension. And we can also apply convolutions across the time dimension, uh, which is usually easier to train, so we do not have the problem of exploding or vanishing radians, so there's no recurrent structure in there. But one challenge is that we need a sufficient receptive field. So since the filters are usually not large, if they look at a specific part of the um, temporal dimension, we need to stack more and more layers to um, yeah, give the last output stage enough um, field of view uh, to the input sequence to actually predict a meaningful uh, future motion, for example. 
So you see an example for a one-dimensional temporal sequence. So we have here an input sequence from x0 to xt. And in this example, uh, you want to predict some outputs for the same temporal um, axis. But you can also imagine that you can here predict future values. And how the temporal convolution works is yeah, that we have these uh, filters here that, for example, here derived um, a new feature based on these three inputs. And then by stacking, you can derive more and more high-level features. And in this case, you see some that these filters skip some inputs. And this is because um, of dilated convolutions, which are a common, uh, pr uh, common technique to increase the receptive field. So by skipping um, these inputs at this level, we can uh, yeah, widen the, um, the, the temporal um, axis we are looking at such that the output here is looking at a way more or uh, lo looks away, uh, looks to a, a larger time horizon in the past. So with the later convolutions, we can uh, counteract this problem of the receptive field. One example of um, convolution in neural networks for motion prediction is the fast and furious method. So here the authors use uh, LiDAR data and um, voxelize the LiDAR points into a bird's eye view, then stack these um, 2D images along a third uh, temporal dimension, and then apply 3D convolution neural networks to, as you can see here, to detect the warning boxes in the scenes. And then uh, with different uh, um, detections, you can also track the objects over time and then predict the future uh, motion as well. So here's the detection at the current time step, here's the detection at the future time steps, and then with the uh, detection, uh, with the tracking, so you then track these different objects over time, you will get future motion predictions. And the um, yeah, interesting thing here is that um, the whole method um, is trained in an end-to-end -end, um, fashion. So the method jointly does detection, tracking, and motion prediction. Um, and the authors motivate this by the fact that in a perception system, you can always have misperceptions, though, for example, it's possible that you do not detect a car, and if you do not detect it, it will also not get tracked and predicted for the future. So if you just assume that you always get perfect input data, so perfect uh, tracked trajectories, and you deploy your model in, um, to, into a real uh, world scenario, uh, then there are situations where you do not get perfect, perfectly tracked trajectories or missed trajectories. And if you um, optimize your model jointly, uh, you do not have these hard decision boundaries that you need to decide at some point, am I now going to output a detection to the next method um, or the next module, or do I um, keep this? And end-to-end -end methods uh, yeah, try to solve this issue such that each task, so detection, tracking, and prediction, um, yeah, are jointly optimized and also support each other during training. So this answers or tries to answer the question, what happens if the perception system fails? And you see the common pipeline we have for end-to-end -end learning. So we have the sensor data, we um, get detections from the data, uh, for example, states. We use these states and track them over time to get trajectories. And with these trajectories, most prediction methods um, basically consider just this part. So they assume to have trajectories and then predict future trajectories, which are then used in motion planning to output the uh, plan of the ego car, so the, basically the future ego motion. And then this is passed to a controller to output control commands. And as I said, if you only consider this part with your model and the trajectories are not perfect because of some misperception, then in reality your performance can uh, degrade a lot. So this is why uh, yeah, people came up with end-to-end -end models that jointly optimize these tasks. Um, here you use raw sensor data and output a few future trajectories. So this is um, close to what the previous method, the Fast and Furious, uh, does. Um, you can also yeah, uh, increase the, the span of the end-to-end -end model and go from sensor data to the future ego motion. So you include the planning into the um, model or even go further and just go from sensor data to control commands. But of course, the more you put into the deep learning model and optimize end-to-end, -end, 
the less you can uh, interpret the results. So you cannot uh, check some intermediate results usually. And it's also not clear how your model then performs in unknown situations. So if you consider this case, for example, if you optimize this with some data you got from expert drivers that drive on a road, since these drivers usually stayed on the road, it can be um, yeah, hard to, to, to reason about how will the model perform if the car is not actually leaving the road. Because if that's not uh, covered in your training data, um, then it's not clear if the correct control commands will be uh, given that you find your way back to the street. Another ongoing field of research is the self-supervised prediction. Here we uh, consider the fact that labeling trajectories is, is usually very expensive. So if you have a large data set and you want to train your prediction method on this, you need to label, for example, the bounding boxes of all the agents at each time step or the trajectories to, to train your method. And uh, one idea to uh, yeah, avoid this problem is that you predict the raw, the raw sensor data into the future. So for example, in this work, the authors um, used a bird's eye view of the environment um, and um, yeah, predicted the future environment. So here you see that there is a car which is approaching the Evo vehicle and the prediction will be that it's passing us at this time step. Or here in this work, the authors considered um, free space forecasting. So here you see the classic way of instances you want to predict. So you will predict that the green car is going to be here. And with free space forecasting, we do not need these detections. Um, but we just know that here was the last time we saw that there is an occupied space and at the time step we are interested in, we predict that this occupied space will be here, at least from what we know from our sensor measurements. And this can be also used in planning to, for example, avoid the path here that will uh, then cross this, this red um, area. So if you have developed your model, the question is how do we evaluate the prediction? This can be important for um, comparing the performance to different methods or baselines, but also for training if you want to compute the loss. There are two common uh, metrics that are used. So the one is the final displacement error and the other one is the average displacement error. So here we have our cow with some past states, so the past trajectory and our ground truth future state. And if we now predict a trajectory, uh, we can evaluate the distance of the physical states at the last time, time steps, which yields our final displacement error. Or we can also compute the distances at all time steps and average them to get the average displacement error. And in general, if you evaluate the methods, you need to account for the fact that some uh, output unimodal trajectories and some output multimodal trajectories, so different hypotheses um, of the future motion, and in this case, you, for example, need to um, decide which trajectory to use for evaluation. So if the method assigns some probabilities to the future motions, then you can, for example, use the one that has the highest uh, estimated probability. And finally, I want to name some uh, data sets and benchmarks. So as I said, the, um, the strength of the deep learning methods is that you can train them on real world data. And this is why a lot of different um, data sets were developed and, and recorded with different sensors used or different um, environments, um, different, uh, um, yeah, uh, <clears throat> different interactions, for example. Some are in the city, some are um, on a highway. Um, for example, these consider highways, intersections or roundabouts. We have the Kitty data set um, also from some car manufacturers. And all these data sets also, or at least some of them, also um, provide benchmarks. So you can test your model on some uh, data where you don't know the labels, so you don't know the future trajectory, and you can evaluate um, the performance of, our, of your method and compare to uh, other methods and see how good you perform in this unknown scenario or unknown data. Yeah, finally, I would like to summarize um, this lecture. So we talked about estimation of intention, traits, or also the future trajectory. And we have seen uh, that this can be very useful for planning uh, our own behavior and our own motion. 
And there were different solution strategies which uh, depend on the model complexity, uh, the level of interaction among the agents, also um, on the realist or how, how realistic the trajectories are, look like. So some were model-based with some parameters we can use. Um, so these are easier models. Uh, some are more complex with um, yeah, large networks that model um, human behavior. So we can also use uh, yeah, large data sets to yeah, predict behavior which is very close to actual human driving. Um, so we have the demonstrations in these data sets and yeah, optimize our methods in order to match their behavior here. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.